website. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, Today's webinar is on understanding bat interactions with wind turbines. Um, this is an introduction to three research projects that um, NREL is supporting. And so um, after I give a quick kind of overview, I'll hand it over to the PIs for um, the Boeing projects, Dantec, um, and EPRI projects. And let's see, there we go. Um, so yeah, just uh, a quick agenda. Um, for the webinar today, um, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end, um, but also feel free to um, provide questions or comments in the chat. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to give a special thanks to Karen Sinclair, who recently retired. Um, Karen was the lead of NREL's environmental portfolio for about 25 years. Um, she initiated the International Energy Agency's Task 34 or REN and was the lead for that for its first six years. From NREL side, she managed the National Wind Coordinating Collaborative, has been involved in dozens of workshops, webinars, um, research briefs, and several uh, NREL techn technical reports and publications. And Karen is out hiking in Alaska right now um, and we wish her well and hope she enjoys her retirement. Um, another um, just quick announcement is that back in December of 2021, uh, NREL and the Renewable Energy Wildlife Institute hosted a bat behavior webinar. That webinar really goes into detail on our current state of the science on how bats perceive and interact with wind turbines um, and also some of the new newer technologies, both um, AI thermal processing and miniature radio tags for tracking um, uh, bats. Um, and so I encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to listen to that webinar, I encourage you to go visit that website. Okay, um, just a quick overview on, on what we currently know and what we're trying to figure out. Um, we, we've known for a, a very long time um, that bat activity and mortality um, increases in late summer, early autumn and decreases with wind speed. Um, these are factors that have been observed in just about every study. There's some variability, but um, it really helps narrow in our focus on um, what's going on at that time and, and under those conditions. Um, so that was kind of our first, based on these early pre-construction, post-construction studies, um, kind of insight into the behavior of these interactions. And then later, um, researchers were able to use thermal video cameras to observe bats as they're interacting with wind turbines. And one of these early studies was done by Horn et al. and observed that bats approach both rotating and non-rotating blades. Um, they either follow the blade tips or are trapped in their vortices, and that they investigate various parts of wind turbines. Um, later, uh, Cryon et al. observed many of these same um, observations. Um, he, that paper reported that bats altered course towards the wind turbines. Um, they characterized some of the behavior as loops and hovering and, and chases around uh, the wind turbine. Um, and that um, in certain situations, um, when wind speeds are um, increasing and there's no blade movement or slow blade movement that bats are approaching from the leeward side. But as the blades start to spin, um, the approaches start to vary from all different directions. Um, more recently, um, Goldenberg et al. noted that a lot of these risky behaviors um, really do start to increase in the late summer. So if we look at this figure on the right, um, upper right here, um, we've got the duration of of observations over time, and we do see an increase um, in how long bats are spending in and around wind turbines as um, we get into late summer and fall, and that these risky behaviors um, of bats spending time in and around wind turbines also uh, increases as we get into uh, late summer and early fall. Um, so all pointing to these, just an increase in interactions and behavior around wind turbines 
but we still don't really fully understand why this is occurring. Um, we've got good evidence that it, it, it is a factor, um, but we're really trying to understand why that is to help us understand how, how best to, to mitigate it. Um, and so what you commonly see um, in video studies is um, one or more bats flying in and around wind turbines, um, whether the blades are moving or not. Um, you see repeated passes, passes in and out of the rotor swept area, um, observations of, of bats at different heights. Um, sometimes you see exploratory behavior where they, they might look like they're <clears throat> touching or maybe actually are touching the wind turbine, um, either the blades, the tower, or the nacelle. Um, and this all, um, as stated, really starts to pick up um, roughly mid-July. Um, so why is this occurring? Um, well, back in 2007, a paper by Coons et al. Um, provided several hypotheses on why um, for, for bat fatalities at, at wind energy facilities. And some of these um, focused on attraction, like the roost attraction hypothesis, so that bats may perceive these structures as potential roosts. Uh, a few years later, um, Crying and Barkley uh, built upon this and, and took these attraction hypotheses and made predictions. So um, if we look at the first one, um, hypothesis that bats might be attracted to light. And the prediction is, if that's the case, then you would see more fatalities at, tur at turbines with aviation lights. Well, we know now that that is not uh, the case. And if we were to go through this list, we might actually be able to mark some of these off. In a paper by Guest et al., um, you know, 13 years later, um, reviewed the literature to find out what we have learned since um, these initial hypotheses were, were posed to the, the bats and wind community. And they looked at papers that used activity data, behavioral data, mortality data, um, and, and how, those, how those data related to some of the leading um, attraction hypotheses, such as foraging, light, mating, noise, um, a, a new one uh, with respect to olfaction, and then roosting. And so what we what we found is that there is some supporting evidence for some of these hypotheses, and there's some evidence that points to whether some of them, you know, just may not be a factor. So with respect to roosting, we do see guano found in and around the base of turbines. We find bats roosting in wind turbine structures, so those are, that's all supporting evidence. Um, with respect to foraging and water, we do know that bat um, sorry, that insect activity uh, occurs in and around wind turbines. We find bat carcasses with full stomachs and insect parts in their mouth. We record feeding buzzes in and around wind turbines. Um, and uh, the echoes that bounce off of the smooth surfaces of wind turbines uh, are identical or very similar to that of echoes bouncing off of water. So that's in close proximity may perceive these as either a food or a water resource. For mating, we do see the presence of multiple bats at a turbine, um, often chasing each other. Um, we do observe spermatozoa in the epididymis of, of male bat carcasses at this time. And we have found bats in the act of mating uh, found as carcasses. For noise, um, the movement of the, the turbine blades, the noise created by that doesn't um, may not be a factor because we do know that bats approach and investigate both moving and non-moving blades. Um, the noise created by anemometers may not um, be a factor either because we don't see any difference in mortality uh, with respect to that noise. Um, lights, we know that bats may orient towards certain wavelengths, um, but there appears to be no relationship between aviation lights and activity or mortality. And uh, as I mentioned, oil faction is, is something that was brought up rather recently um, in that bats may key in on the scent that is either left by other bats who might mark the, the wind turbine or from the insects that um, the insect bodies that accumulate on the blades. Um, so we're starting to get information on this, but there's, there's still a lot more that needs to be figured out. We also need to keep in mind that these attraction hypotheses may vary by species, may vary by circumstance. So what happens in a 
agricultural setting may be very different from a, a forested setting, and these attractions may that's may perceive different attractions at different scales. So with that, um, I do want to turn it over to our um, project leads. So um, to help us understand why bats are interacting with wind turbines, NREL, with support from the Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technologies Office, selected three projects during a competitive um, proposal process. Um, total project funding is 1.1 million across these projects. Um, the awardees were the Bowman Consulting Group, Stantec Consulting Services, and the Electric Power Research Institute. And so, um, Sarah, I will end my presentation and turn it over to you, and then we'll hear from Trevor Peterson and Donald Solik. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Let me see if I can get this set up. Okay. Can y'all see my screen all right? Um, yeah, it's in presentation mode though, sir. It's in, okay, got it. There we go, how about now? Perfect. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, thank you for joining us today and thank you to Enroll not only for funding, but giving us the opportunity to present our study. Um, our idea and our design today. And uh, I'm going to warn, I have a hound dog puppy and he decided to just start chewing on my computer cord as we speak. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best to try to eliminate that issue. Um, oh, and I, and I did want to highlight that our project is titled Quantifying, Quantifying Bat Interactions with Wind Turbines, Assessing Attraction Hypotheses. So my name is Sarah Weaver and I am the natural resources team lead uh, for Bowman Consulting. We are an international consulting firm that provides uh, planning, engineering, surveying, GIS, land procurement, and other types of services to a broad range of clients and developers. Uh, my co-PI is the founder of Wildlife Imaging Systems, uh, which develops advanced uh, machine vision and machine learning solutions for a um, for the wildlife research uh, realm. And I have a dog chewing on a squeaky toy. Can you all give me just a moment to try to correct that so I can actually make sure you can hear me? Apologies for this. <laughs> he was great, like for the last 30 minutes and then he woke up. Um, one second while I try to go correct this. Okay, sorry, I was supposed to do this up at work, but my internet's not working, so I had to do it at home, so apologies. Okay, um, so anyway, back to where I was. Um, I also want to highlight that we have a team of folks working with us at Bowman and at Wildlife Imaging Systems that are the boots on the ground, and they're helping to collect the data, so I want to acknowledge and thank them as well. Okay, so I want to first start by discussing where the idea for the study came from, which Chris already kind of highlighted. Um, the impetus for this project partly stems from the above publication, which he mentioned already, which was an update to the Crine and Barclay 2009 uh, publication. Specifically, this was looking at the current state of knowledge on bat attraction hypotheses. And in this publication, we found that while more than a decade had passed since Crine and Barclay had proposed various hypotheses for bat attraction to wind turbines, we still had a lot of data gaps and questions. Um, so additionally, uh, we proposed a new hypothesis, as he mentioned, based on scent or olfaction in the manuscript, and that came from the observations that uh, was from another study uh, made during thermal cameras uh, looking up at Met Towers in Texas, in which we noted focal behaviors of bats at the towers, and we wanted to explore if the same behavior is seen at wind turbines. These images show these focal behaviors that you can see on the bottom. And I want to acknowledge the co-authors of this publication that's shown, as well as Dr. Sarah Fritz and Rob Tyler, the advisor and student at Texas State University uh, that are working on the Met Tower project at Texas State and Duke Energy for funding that project. So for this particular study, we are looking for behavioral evidence for all the various attraction hypotheses, not just the scent hypothesis. 
Uh, the first portion of the work will be observational, noting any interesting patterns or lack of patterns observed in the airspace around wind turbines. We are further hoping to use that data to generate quantitative features uh, that correspond to the observations, as well as to assess bat behaviors and collisions with spatial, temporal, operational, and weather conditions. So for our study area, we have three study sites um, with various turbine sizes and tower heights that represent a large longitudinal space depicted in this map. And one more time, going to have to let the dog out. <laughs> Pets, okay. Um, so the most northern is the Black Oak Wind Facility in Minnesota, um, owned and operated by AEP. Relo Del Sol is in the South Texas area and is owned and operated by EDP Renewables. And the third is Los Vientos, also in South Texas, owned and operated by Duke Energy. Uh, we want to thank all of these partners for access to their facilities. The data from Los Vientos was already correct, uh, collected. It was a part of my dissertation, uh, which we monitored three wind turbines in 2017. And we are collecting video from the other two sites to supplement that data set and increase our sample size. At both Black Oak and Relo Del Sol, we are collecting data at two wind turbines from July through October of this year. So the study is already underway. For the system design, one of the benefits of our current system is that it doesn't require integration with the wind turbine or a permanent power source. They're powered by a solar panel and battery, which can be easily moved and record all video to an internal SD card. This image depicts that the field of view is backed away from the turbine to minimize the amount of airspace blocked by the tower. Um, this position allows us to see bad activity regardless of the nacelle yaw direction. I swear my dogs don't ever act like this. Normally I have zero idea what is going on and why it is so loud in my house right now. It's like they knew I was giving a presentation, okay. Okay, and this slide is to show what the setup actually looks like. The image on the left and the top right display what the cameras are seeing, while the bottom left shows the setup with cameras on tripods and cattle fencing surrounding the cameras to protect them from animals. In my experience, largely cows. Cows are very curious and like to knock these things over, so it's very important to protect them. These images are part of the qualitative review process. They are 10 minute summary images produced from cameras at Relo Del Sol for the qualitative review component. And these images are relatively fast and easy to create for wildlife imaging systems because they developed the algorithms prior to this study. And they allow for us to quickly look at and look for interesting patterns that may be worthy of further exploration without having to view all the video. Each individual image represents a 10 minute summary of the video in a single image. And the yellow spots are detections of animal tracks, in this case, they're bats. And again, wildlife imaging systems develop the algorithms to detect bats and, and their identification prior to the study. Um, the algorithms also are capable of removing the blades from the photos so that they don't overwhelm the images. And again, just wanna highlight that they allow us to see bat paths to note behaviors and patterns without reviewing all of the video. Uh, with these images, we can also get a rough gauge of depth by looking at the size of the bat in the image and note that big or larger bats means that they're closer to the video, um, whereas smaller means they might be further away, as well as if the bat is in front of or behind the tower, above or below the nacelle, et cetera. And these are all classifications that we will include in our behavioral analyses. So in addition to the image data, each detection is saved into a database, um, allowing us to create tracks like you see here, which connects the detection th to get detections together in space. And from these tracks, we hope to be able to create a quantitative characterization of the behavior occurring, such as frequency of flight patterns, like looping, chasing, um, focal behaviors, approach direction, just to name a few. We can also place detections into time bins, like you see here, which allows us to compare activity and hopefully behavior. Um, and we can compare these two things like weather, spatial and temporal covariates, um, but also gives us an idea of when activity is highest throughout a night. As you can see here, represented by bat seconds of activity in the colors, time of night is on the x-axis and date is on the y-axis. 
So the brighter yellow indicates that there are higher levels of activity, and this demonstrates that it is often clustered into relatively short periods of time throughout the night. And again, our goals with this study are to identify behavioral patterns at wind turbines, determine if we see focal behaviors like we did during the Met Tower study, and determine if identified behaviors relate to particular spatial, temporal, and weather covariates. We also hope to identify these behaviors in relationship to risk, because bats flying through the airspace at a wind turbine aren't as, at as high of a risk for collision as those that are staying in the area around the wind turbines. So ultimately, we are wanting these data to contribute to our understanding um, of when and why bats are at the most risk for collision to inform strategies to reduce these risks. So thank you again to NREL for funding and for everyone joining us today. Um, we are very excited to share these results once the project is completed. Um, I want to add that anecdotally, we are collecting some really awesome data right now that we already think will be very enlightening for the wind energy and bat research community. Um, so just a little teaser for when we are able to present formal results, so stay tuned. I believe we're doing questions at the end, um, but our contact information is listed here just in case we are able to get to your question. Please don't hesitate to email either Brogan or I. And uh, now I'll pass it back to Chris and mute myself so you guys don't have to hear my dogs anymore. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, Trevor? Um... Great, I'll share my video here while I can. I may mute my, I may um, pause that if the connection proves unreliable. All right, is this, uh, can everybody see this? Yes, thanks. Great. Um, well, yeah, I share Sarah's gratitude to NREL for the opportunity to pursue this research and um, appreciate your interest here today. So our project where we're, it, it's, you'll notice a lot of similarities with um, what, what Sarah's just described. And we, we've, we're sort of calling our, our project, do you see what I hear? Do I hear what you see? And really the goal is to combine acoustic detectors with thermal video data to both characterize the distribution of bats and echolocation behavior, but also on a practical level to better understand what acoustic data are actually representing when we collect them um, from the top of a wind turbine. Um, this work is a collaboration with between Stantec and also with Wildlife Imaging Systems. Um, we are employing essentially the, the identical camera system that, that Sarah described on her project. Um, and our work will be occurring at two different commercial wind farms, uh, the Bingham Wind Farm here in Maine, where I actually am today, and then the Kings Point Wind uh, Project in Southwestern Missouri. Um, we, the impetus for these two sites so that we were already on site doing um, acoustic standardized acoustic monitoring at turbines at both sites and it presented an opportunity to supplement those acoustic detectors with cameras to better understand what we're detecting and what we're not detecting using acoustic detectors and to fill in a lot of voids that acoustics leaves in terms of physically and spatially where bats are occurring within the rotor swept zone and um, uh, using ground mounted data to fill that that void that that acoustics cannot. So again, um, currently we have bat detectors deployed on the nacelles and you can, um, there's a very small horizontal bar coming off the top of this turbine where we uh, deploy SM4, our omnidirectional full spectrum microphones. And so they're essentially monitoring the airspace behind the nacelle of turbines. That's a way that we've been monitoring acoustics for about 10 years. And we've been using these data to help evaluate and design curtailment strategies with the the basis of this is the, the connection that we found between the proportion of bad activity exposed to turbine operation you know occurring when the turbines are on with fatality risk that being said acoustics can monitor a relatively small area of the turbine and there's quite a lot of evidence that the bats are not always echolocating similarly we can't monitor uh, the lower part of the rotor swept zone where potentially some of the, the most interactions occurring um, between bats and turbines. So by adding cameras, we're able to align these data sets and figure out what proportion of, of um, what we're seeing and not hearing and vice versa, what we're hearing and not seeing. And so the, the 
research, we have practical goals of how essentially driven towards better understanding how to collect and how to interpret acoustic data from turbines, and then broader research questions that, that get at the factors that might be affecting echolocation behavior and how this may in turn affect you know, the, the assumptions that we can make using um, turbine mounted acoustics. And that's a little circle around where the detector is in this case. We also have detectors partway up the turbine. So again, the, the underlying reason for a lot of this work from a practical standpoint is to better guide and evaluate the effectiveness of curtailment strategies. And to do this, we have a good sense that acoustics provides a lot of good information on the temporal variation in activity on a, in terms of a seasonal basis and also temporal within the time of night. And it provides relatively good information on species composition, but we're really limited to that small cone of detection. But acoustics appears to be a, a relatively good me measure and relatively easy to deploy at scale of how effectively curtailment strategies can avoid risk to bats. But as we move towards the idea of using acoustics or relying more on acoustics for these purposes, a lot of questions do arise that can perhaps be better addressed with, with some of the video data. I think this is one of the same images that Sarah, Sarah shared. And so we've, we're teaming with Brogan to have um, wildlife imaging systems um, deploy cameras at a subset of these same turbines. And so currently we have um, four cameras out just as a test, but we're going to be shortly having 10 cameras out at each of these wind facilities. So monitoring 10 different turbines at um, Bingham and also at Kings Point. So the nice opportunity with two projects like this is that they present potentially an order of magnitude different baseline bat activity levels and presumably um, risk levels to bats. And so it, from a practical standpoint, it's nice to have the opportunity to use the same techniques in very different landscapes and very different regions and presumably different uh, risk profiles for bats. Thermal video, again, is providing that visual spatial component. And so each measure is sort of filling in and supplementing some of the gaps left by the other. Specifically, what we're interested with the thermal video is categorizing activity based on you know, 10 minute bins of how many flight paths we're seeing and what regions of the turbines to try to get a sense of spatially within the rotor swept zone, where are, where are most interactions occurring? And this has implications, of course, if you're trying to understand the effectiveness of curtailment in avoiding bad activity. If there's a lot of activity happening at the bottom of the rotor sweep that we're unable to detect with a nacelle mounted detector, that has implications for how best to monitor and, and where uh, microphones should be positioned. And if there are very different patterns going on in different portions of the rotor sweep zone, that's obviously also important to understand when thinking about um, measuring and managing risk. So broadly, again, the research questions are to tease out the various factors that might be affecting bat echolocation behavior. And what I mean by bat echolocation behavior is uh, essentially the tendency to be echolocating or not. So again, if we're seeing bats that we're not detecting, that we can confirm are going through the, the rotors or the uh, zone of detection of a bat detector, we can quantify that and determine whether or not there's relationships or variation according to time of, near, of year, time of night, um, species composition, which we can pull from the acoustic detectors and other spatial factors. And then ultimately align these data, as, as Sarah also mentioned, with uh, spatial and temporal covariates to understand whether these, um, whether the tendency to echolocate or the tendency to be present in a certain of rotor swap portion of the rotor swap zone are um, variable versus consistent. On the practical side, um, we hope to guide or provide feedback on where acoustic detectors should best be placed to measure acoustic exposure, to determine whether this metric of acoustic exposure is consistent indicator of fatality risks. I should mention there's also carcass standardized carcass monitoring that will be occurring at the Kings Point site. So we'll have that component of the puzzle as well. And ultimately, do cameras and acoustic detectors tell us the same thing or the, the feedback that these pieces of equipment provide substantially different? Ultimately, that information will help us guide um, longer term monitoring strategies and figure out which of these techniques 
is most appropriate for um, certain types of analyses. And with that, I hopefully we'll, we'll have time at the end for questions. I'll hand the mic back over to Chris. Thanks, Trevor. Um, and then for our last presentation, turn it over to Donald. Okay. Let's share things. Yep, it's it's all there. I'm all queued up. Great. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, thanks again for uh, putting together this webinar, Chris uh, and Haley. We really appreciate this. So, uh, good day. I'm Donald Solik with EPRI. And to round out today's webinar, I'm going to be sharing a project that we're doing in conjunction with Back Conservation International, the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, the University of Iowa, and Mid-American Energy titled Quantifying Bat Interactions with Wind Turbines and Trees to Assess Potential Attraction Hypotheses. It's a mouthful. And advance. Oh, good. So wind facilities alter air currents. And so this photo of an offshore facility in fog um, illustrates that really well, uh, where you see wakes forming uh, downwind of the different wind turbines here. And these wake zones are characterized as areas with low turbulence and low wind speeds shown in blue in both these figures. And these conditions may be favorable to small flying animals trying to reduce the economic costs of flight. Some evidence that bats prefer wake zones comes from research by Cryan and others in 2014. Uh, they investigated bat behavior at wind turbines using thermal videography. And as Chris mentioned earlier, they found that 80% of bat detections were on the downwind side of turbines. In addition to more favorable conditions for flight, uh, wakes behind tall structures could create favorable conditions for bats to find and capture insects, which may also be concentrated in these low or lower airflow areas. Um, or wakes may indicate the presence of potential roost sites for tree roosting bats, which are the main species killed at wind facilities. So with all that in mind, our objectives were to one, uh, determine how airflow patterns at wind turbines and trees differ and how that influences bat activity and flight behaviors that may affect attraction to turbines. Two, we wanted to relate acoustic and video observations and collisions with spatial, temporal, operational, and weather conditions. And three, we wanted to quantify how bats' flight behaviors may relate to airflow patterns near wind turbines. Okay. So our team is composed of leading experts in the fields of bat behavior, three-dimensional thermal videography, acoustic monitoring, machine learning, wake modeling, and statistical analyses. Uh, Mid-American Energy is providing access to the Orient Wind Farm, which is our study site. And that is located in Southwest Iowa by this red dot where you can hopefully see my cursor. Uh, this facility has 308 turbines. We're monitoring two of them that are indicated by the yellow stars. Now, this, um, so Orient is also the location of a department, uh, Department of Energy Research is being done by several of our team members to um, test the effects of the timer smart curtailment system on bat fatalities and on annual energy production. So timer uses bat detectors installed on the nacelle and connected to the facility SCADA data system. If a uh, bat is detected and certain weather conditions are met, then the system will shut down turbines for 30 minutes, reducing the risk to bats. For this study, uh, the two turbines we selected are equipped with timer and are being searched daily for bat fatalities 
using detection dogs. So in uh, late July, we visited the site to deploy equipment, which involved setting up uh, solar panel arrays for power and lots of fine tuning of cameras and detectors and computers to get configurations just right. Uh, we started data collection on August 1st and we will continue through October 7th, covering the period of highest bat fatality at this site. Okay, so to best illustrate the layout of our equipment, this square represents a, a, a bat's eye view of our 160 by 160 meter cleared plot, uh, with the gray oval here representing the rotor swept zone of the turbine when the wind direction is from the southeast, as it usually is at this facility. Then the square on the right represents the profile view. So at the base of each turbine, we deployed two FLIR A65 thermal cameras directed towards the Northwest to cover the area where the wake is most likely to occur. The cameras are spaced apart and angled to have overlapping fields of view, allowing us to construct 3D video imaging during post-processing. And we're estimating that these cameras can detect bat-sized objects at 200 meters. So here's one of our cameras. It's networked and synced with another camera that's off screen about 30 meters to the right. The orange rectangle here is a rough approximation of its field of view, encompassing some of our detectors, which are shown in red way down there by the edge of the corn. Now we've also placed two sets of FLIR um, FC series cameras at each turbine. Uh, but these are facing the nacelle region of the turbine from upwind and from downwind. So at each turbine, we have six cameras total, providing three sets of 3D video at each turbine, covering airspace along the direction of likely airflow. And here's an image of uh, one of those uh, FLIR FC series cameras facing the nacelle. We'll see video from this camera in a bit. Okay, so we also deployed ultrasonic bat detectors to record echolocation calls and allow us to identify bats seen flying on the videos. Uh, the black hexagons here represent the timer rebat system that's um, up on top of the nacelle. And the black square and black triangle just indicate the airspace that's being monitored by that detector. We also deployed three Anabat Swifts along the direction of likely airflow um, at each turbine. And these detectors have a directional microphone that was angled upwards to uh, detect bats approximately 30 to 50 meters above the ground. Paired with two of those, we also have Acrobat detectors. Um, these acrobat detectors are unique in that they have seven sensors that can be used to detect bats and track their movements in three-dimensional space. These acrobats have a hemispherical zone of detection. So um, altogether, we have blanketed the direction of likely airflow with video and audio recording. If bats behave as we expect, uh, we may be able to detect them up to 200 meters away possibly turning into the wake, and then track them as they approach the turbine, identifying them with acoustics along the way. So our three types of detectors are shown on the left with the uh, timer rebat. Uh, you can't see it, but it's up there on top of the nacelle. Uh, on the right, we have the Acrobat on a two meter pole and the Swift on a seven meter pole. The uh, Acrobat is connected to a laptop, which is being powered by these uh, solar panels. So lastly, we're using SCADA data from the wind farm to develop an analytical wake model. And we're validating and calibrating that model using data collected at site-specific weather stations that we've installed. 
So here's our overall schematic with the uh, weather stations included up here and down there. Okay. So we're also monitoring bat movements at tall trees on the landscape. These trees were selected based on accessibility, uh, their protection from vandalism, and isolation from turbines. Our deployment of trees is uh, similar to our deployment of turbines, but uh, the scale is much smaller. Here we are uh, deploying uh, two more sets of FLIR FC series cameras, but these have a wider field of view and they're being placed 20 meters away from the tree and angled to monitor the airspace on either side of the tree. We also paired two sets of swifts and acrobats at each tree to record and identify uh, any bats flying in the vicinity of the tree, provided they do echolocate. And we collected site-specific weather data using weather stations at the trees. So ultimately, uh, this is the type of data that we'll be collecting, or that we are collecting with all of our uh, uh, cameras. This is a two-dimensional view of a bat-like object uh, detected on the downward side of one of our turbines. Um, I'll play this in a moment, but we, we have this event in multiple camera views to create a 3D view, but we're in the process of generating tracks for that, so you get a 2D view today, so playing now. And so from our multiple camera angles, we know that this object is flying actually up near the uh, nacelle height. And so it's actually fairly far away from our camera. I'll play it one more time because why not? Okay. Oops, now I'm playing it again. We don't wanna do that. All right. So the uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates of potential bat targets are determined using through tracker open source software developed by the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. And then for this project, the University of Iowa has developed YOLO enabled machine learning to enhance through trackers detection algorithm. And so here's an example of using tracks for generating 3D calibration. The um, green dots are some preliminary detections. We don't really know what animals they are yet. Uh, but these data are from one of our FLIR A65 uh, camera pairs that are facing downwinds towards the wake. Now, 3D calibration is not easy for this set of cameras since we don't have a turbine to uh, help calculate or calibrate uh, distance. But um, uh, we developed a novel approach to uh, uh, dealing with that, that, that issue. Um, so it, this figure here is showing that we've detected one large object approximately 200 meters away from our cameras and approximately 40 meters in altitude. Uh, now this particular object was so large and rendered so well that it, it's probably not a bat. We were thinking it might be a, a goose or something. Um, but uh, we also have a number of smaller objects that were detected from 50 to 100 meters away, which are more likely to be bats. And, and the, these data just come from a, a few uh, early nights in August. Um, you're going to have to stay tuned for uh, more robust results um, next summer. So uh, with that, uh, thank you. Um, and my team and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Donald. Um, and thanks to all our presenters again. Um, really excited about these three projects. They span different technologies, different parts of the country, um, from South Texas up to Minnesota, all the way out to Maine. So I think we're also able to look at that behavior of different sets of species, um, which is exciting. Um, so if you have questions for any of our uh, speakers, you can either put it in the chat or raise your hand and I'll try to keep track of um, who's typing and who whose hand is raised.
No questions, any comments? You all did a great job of explaining your studies. That's impressive. I think that's a first. <laughs> uh, anyone else doing video behavioral work that they want to just mention? Hi, Chris, it's Rimple here. I have a question. Great, go ahead. Um, hi, everyone, Rimple Sandu from Anral. Um, I have a question to Sarah. Um, you mentioned classification into tracks. I wonder how that classification works in terms of computing the persistence if a bat moves out of the field of view and then re-enters again. How does that, does that cl get yeah. classified as a different bat or, or the same bat? Yeah, technically once a bat leaves the view, we can't know whether or not it's the same individual if it comes back in. Uh, but part of what we'll be looking at is things like the the maximum minimum number of bats that are within a frame at a single time so that we can get at how many bats could be active in the airspace around the wind turbine. But yeah, once it leaves the view, um, it's assumed that um, it is like we can't assume that it is the same bat. Um, we can suspect based on how quickly or what the path and trajectory is, for instance, if it were to loop out of the image and then come right back in, we can, you know, assume that that might be the same one. Um, Brogan is on here too, and so I'm sure he might have some more to add to to those types of detections. Yeah, all right. So we make, it has, as Sarah mentioned, it has to be like a very brief, and it has to be very spatially right uh, close to where it exited the screen for us to make that. If it's anything beyond, you know, a handful of frames. Um, it becomes very hard to automate that sort of like assumption. So it's pretty limited uh, how much we uh, try to keep tracks together um, when they actually exit the frame. Okay, that makes sense. I imagine this issue becomes more um, complicated if there's multiple bats entering and exiting the field of view. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. But we do think it's, uh, for us, we're going to be able to tell like the maximum number of bats that are seen in a single frame at a single time will give us an idea of the number of bats that are truly active within the rotor sweep. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for our speakers? Yes, go ahead. Yee? Yes, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for this great um, presentation. I have a question. I think I noticed that this um, research focus um, based on uh, land-based wind turbines. I was wondering how would you modify your study design or technology for like offshore wind turbines. Thank you. Uh, this is Trevor. I could just offer up. Uh, it's a great question and um, certain things are much easier. Everything is much easier onshore, I would say, than offshore. Um, acoustic detectors as deployed on turbines could presumably collect the identical type of information from an offshore turbine. Um, cameras, of course, get a lot trickier because there's not typically an opportunity to deploy cameras at the appropriate distance from an offshore platform. Um, so that becomes much more complicated. And so I think, you know, I would I would think that one of the potential applications of these projects would be, you know, the more we understand about what acoustic data actually represent, the easier it will be to interpret acoustic data from offshore turbines. So of all the methods that are available that I'm aware of, acoustics are about the only one that can be deployed in essentially the same way if you're talking about nacelle height. Um, so, you know, camera technology is getting better and better, but turbines offshore are so far apart from one another typically that it, it would be 
unfeasible to um, monitor one turbine from another, but um, that's my current understanding. Others can certainly chime in. Yeah, I'd also add too that just the conditions in the offshore setting can can be very difficult with technologies like this, um, and ensuring that the cameras themselves are going to remain operational in those types of conditions um, would would be a very important step. Um, I think one of the things that I've heard Chris himself say a number of times is that if we're going to do anything out in the offshore space, we should probably verify it, it's going to work onshore. I'm not sure if we've got a great method right now for determining if cameras are going to be viable in the offshore space at the moment. I hope somebody's working on that though. That would be great. And then, uh, yeah, for our study, my my limited understanding of wakes is that they um, tend to are, are, are much easier to um, uh, measure over the ocean because there's there's less landforms uh, complicating things. So if we do find an attraction to uh, wakes on land, um, presumably that would also uh, attract them over the ocean and we might be able to um, uh, have a more precise idea of where the wakes are over the ocean. Um, I also see that Christian Newman, one of our uh, EPRI team members has his hand raised and probably wants to say something. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, actually, I wasn't going to yeah, I wasn't actually going to sort of uh, address that, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that's true. Uh, just two things. One is, you know, Kaj, we actually we talked about putting sensors up on the turbines to try to measure different temperature and different things. It became um, it be, it started to get too complicated and too kind of expensive. But again, I think that's an important thing about looking at temperature in around the turbines uh, and other things like that. Uh, the one, the one thing which is uh, that I was at, at some point, not now, obviously, but I think you know, just kind of as, as we all sort of go down this road, and and as cameras become more common, <clears throat> and this is maybe something for you, Chris, is like uh, you know, maybe sort of like coming up with maybe some standard standard ways of reporting out kind of like bad activity with cameras, like you know, what is it? Should we do like 10 minute increments? Should we do something else? I mean, I don't know. I mean, we're all, you know, for this kind of research, we're all kind of looking at very specific problems, but, you know, kind of like with acoustics and other things, as we sort of get going, it'd probably be good early on to try to at least have these kind of research things start to report out things in maybe a common way if possible. So just kind of list, we're all, yeah, anyway. Thanks, Christian. Um, Julia, do you want to, um, you have your hand raised? I do. Uh, so I was just going to go back to the offshore thing because we do actually have at the moment, well, we've had for a year, two systems deployed offshore with thermographic, stereothermographic and acoustics and an ambient light and motor sort of all integrated. And so that using a multi-sensor approach is definitely something that um, we're seeing like different different things particularly with birds um, so I'm assuming it would be the same for bats that are recorded from the acoustics as uh, you know from the uh, ambient light when we see see things that we can identify from that or from the motor systems um, but you're absolutely right when Trevor was saying that um, you can't get the the camera far enough away, right? To um, to see like a huge amount of the road strip zone. You can see the road strip zone, but you know I'm really curious about this wake effect, and and we will definitely look in our in this year. So we've got altogether we've got three years of study. The cameras function well. I mean we haven't had any, none of them have have failed us. Um, we have a system in place where we can see in real time whether things are working. So it's Sarah's point that's kind of that's kind of being done but um but looking looking into this wake effect and we will definitely share any of that information or, uh, you know with you guys um if we do see anything um if we can look at that so that was just I just wanted to say that thank you um yeah one of you know I think one of the other challenges for offshore um aside from like logistics is just that the turbines are so big um we're able to put th cameras on the ground either at the base of the turbine or, or slightly um, away from the base 
and and still are not able to capture the entire rotor swept area. Um, and the cameras that we're using now can distinguish a bat from from other objects at about tip height um, for for most turbines on, on shore. Um, but offshore, it's it's just difficult with the the camera technology that we have to capture. The, the entire rotor swept area or all the way out to the tips of the blades if the camera's um, positioned at the base. So there are a lot of challenges um, uh, with placement, uh, weatherization, um, and just visualization with current technologies. Um, Adam? Hi, Chris. Um, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if there's any potential application for monitoring, post-construction monitoring, um, either supplementing what we currently do with standardized searches or replacing that in a cost-effective way. Um, I can <clears throat> I can answer that question real quick. I'm sure Brogan will want to jump in too. Um, we actually didn't talk about this, uh, but we have a separate study that is um, funded by another source uh, that's going on in tandem at the Rilo del Sol site where we are actually testing a fatality monitoring camera system. Um, so we are hoping to actually get an even larger data set and interesting pool of information based on um, that tandem study that's going on with this. So that we are working on that as we speak. And, and I jump in, this is Trevor, I jump in to add that if your purpose, if the purpose of the post-construction carcass monitoring is to evaluate the success of something like curtailment, I think that either cameras or acoustics can, can work very well in that context um, because you're able to monitor activity that's actively being avoided. So you can show that there are bats present at a time when the turbine is curtailed and evaluate the, the degree to which curtailment is encompassing those, those periods of activity. And that's something that where carcass data is always limited because you, you're not, you have no feedback uh, as to how much fatality you've actually avoided. And it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult and it's always complicated to try to compare curtailment strategies with carcasses due to limited, limited uh, sample size. So I'm optimistic that, that all of these technologies that are being tested under this um, research program could have pretty great applications for um, specifically for evaluating the success of of curtailment strategies or other minimization measures. Great. Well, um, so this this webinar will be posted on the TITA's website, and I'll, I'll put a in a link here in just a second um, for for where that will be located. And then um, as these projects um, wrap up their data collection and analyses, um, we'll be sharing um, that via webinar as well. And I'm sure that the the project teams will be. Um, presenting their findings at conferences. Um, the ultimate goal is to have um, the work published um, in the peer review literature as well. So we will be sure to keep everybody up to date on um, these projects. Um, and I see that Haley just posted the link um, for where the webinar will be. So um, with that, we're, we're at our time. I really appreciate everybody's um, time today. Um, for joining the webinar and thanks to Sarah, uh, Donald and Trevor for taking the time to present. Um, hope you have a good rest of your day and thanks again for joining. Thank, Thank you. you.